And I want to talk this evening about uh, some aspects of um, the, the story of faith in London. And uh, my original title was regarded as a misprint, so I think didn't make it through. Uh, what I want to think about is um, the role of faith communities in remembering, with a hyphen, re-hyphen-membering London, uh, the role of the faith communities, particularly at the moment, in uh, operating in what is a really significant international laboratory. Because we have a great city where just one of the secondary schools, which I know well in Haringey, the pupils there speak between them. There are about 800 pupils. They speak 70 languages from Albanian to Zulu. So it is an extraordinary laboratory. Uh, it, it will either be uh, a beacon of hope uh, for the new multipolar world into which we are transiting, or it will be a dreadful warning. Uh, and I want to think uh, about the role of faith communities in uh, that kind of modern scenario. But let's, let's have a look at some of the story to begin with. Ken Livingston, reflecting on his many years of involvement in London government, uh, noted two major changes during his time in the life of the capital. The population had grown and, quotes, it was a much more religious city. An interesting thing for Ken Livingstone to say and see. And his view was confirmed by the results of the 2011 census, which revealed that London was significantly more religiously observant than the UK as a whole. This was uh, the reverse of the situation when serious research began in the 1970s. London was at the bottom of the league in terms of religious observance. The census of 2011 revealed that uh, over 48% of Londoners identified themselves as Christians. That, of course, is vastly greater than the numbers of uh, uh, practicing Christians. 20% didn't identify with any religion for various reasons. 12% said they were Muslims, 5% Hindus, 1.8% Jewish, and the presence of a plethora of smaller groups makes London a home for every conceivable religious belief, including a, uh, an enthusiastic Jedi community. Now, this phenomenon of the religiosity of London has been very little studied by mainstream commentators on London in its future, except, of course, in the context of the threat posed by religious extremism. But in contrast, I propose to give a very brief sketch of the story of faith communities in London over the centuries, demonstrate their growing diversity, and offer some hope that they could play a significant and constructive part in London's future. Now, we are met in the Museum of London, and if you go to the Before London galleries, you'll see the Dagenham Idol, because this uh, museum houses evidence of prehistoric religious belief in the London area. But as you know, Londinium itself was a creation of the Roman Empire. And religious life in London was extraordinarily diverse in the second century AD when the empire reached its apogee. Traditional deities jostled newcomers from the eastern Mediterranean. There is a mid-third century Upper Thames Street inscription recalling the rebuilding of a temple of Isis from Egypt. Excavation has also revealed a Southwark temple, a temple precinct dedicated to Mars. Now, nobody knows who first brought news of Jesus Christ, the imperial outpost of Britannia, such was the excellence of the Roman communication system 
it would have taken comparatively little time to report the events that had occurred in Jerusalem. Their spiritual significance, however, was available only to believers, and it's unclear when the first Christian arrived in Londinium. The story of the martyrs in Lyon, in the Rhone Valley in the year 177 AD, and the subsequent writings of Bishop Irenaeus indicate the presence of a sizable Greek-speaking Christian community in the Rhone Valley by the last quarter of the second century. And we can imagine that along with imported wine and Samian ware pottery, some trader from Gaul brought the news of how a prophet called Jesus had been crucified and then raised from the dead. Constantine, proclaimed at York in 306, eventually became the first Christian emperor. In issuing the Edict of Milan in 313, he legalized the practice of the Christian religion in his part of the Roman Empire. And the following year, he summoned the bishops of the West to a council in Arles, in southern France, to consider the disorders in the church in North Africa. A bishop of London, Restitutus, is recorded as having been present at the Council of Arles, 314. Three British bishops attended the Council of Rimini in 359. We know because they asked for state assistance with their traveling expenses. But London in the fourth century still retained considerable religious diversity. The London Temple of Mithras, for example, which has been represented uh, in the basement of the Bloomberg building, was operating until at least 350. But the burial of cult objects later in the century suggests growing Christian influence in line with developing imperial policy. But in the convulsions which attended the evacuation of the legions in the early 5th century, the unique survival of the Roman name Londinium, almost all other city sites from Roman times have been rechristened by later inhabitants. The survival of Londinium suggests that London was never entirely abandoned and has never been entirely deserted since imperial times. But the arrival of the pagan Anglo-Saxons submerged the church, the church of Bishop Restitutus. And the other bishops of uh, Roman times, some of whom we only know their names. I would have loved to have met Bishop Fastidius, who was another uh, of those Roman prelates, but we know virtually nothing about him apart from that. Place names in Essex and uh, also Harrow on the Hill uh, suggest shrines of pagan worship. Harrow on the Hill was a significant pagan shrine formerly called Gumeninga Hair. But the major English rulers of the turn of the 6th and 7th century felt the attraction of the sophisticated culture of continental Europe. Rome and the church exercised uh, quite a pull. And it was in this context that Pope Gregory the Great sent Augustine, a Roman monk, to Kent in 597. And he followed that up with a second missionary expedition led by a Roman abbot, Melitus, and he was consecrated as Bishop of London in 604, and 604 is when he built the very first St. Paul's Cathedral on the hill where it still stands. This Diocese of London, the new one, was to be coterminous with East Saxon territory, at this point ruled by a Christian convert, King Sebat, a nephew of the King of Kent. The East Saxons never amounted to that much. They never got across the river. Uh, East Saxon territory was Essex, Middlesex, southeastern part of Hertfordshire. And one of the remarkable factors about modern London is the way in which the Thames is such a frontier 
uh, and uh, South Londoners feel uncomfortable in North London and vice versa, and uh, the patterns of uh, local government and transport links really reflect that 7th century situation where the South Bank was occupied by the West Saxon tribe and the North Bank was occupied by the East Saxons. The Venerable Bede records what happened when King Sebat died. His three sons uh, came to power, all of them pagans. And we are told that seeing the bishop celebrating the Holy Mysteries, the Eucharist in St. Paul's, they demanded the consecration, the consecrated bread. They were typical Essex lads, really. <laughs> Melitus, uh, uh, we might imagine, you know, faced with these uh, three large Essex lads, Melitus, uh, no doubt, very tactfully explained that um, uh, baptism was the preliminary to actually uh, taking the bread and the wine in communion. The Essex lads answered, and uh, I quote Bede here, we will not enter the font because we know that we have no need of it, but all the same we wish to be refreshed by the bread. In vain the bishop insisted that that wasn't possible, you know, it wasn't the sort of structure, and he was thrown out. He was expelled. And the situation remained very fluid until the arrival of a Greek monk from Tarsus, the birthplace of St. Paul, who was already 66 when he was consecrated Archbishop of Canterbury by Pope Vitalian and arrived in England in 669. And he had in mind the organization of the church in the urban culture of the Christian East, and he insisted on making sure that bishops had seats, that they were sedentarized, whereas previously they'd wandered around the place. And one of the most significant figures in the early history of London was appointed by Archbishop Theodore of Tarsus in 675, and that was Erkenwald. He was the patron saint of the city until the 17th century. Erkenwald, appointed to London, having founded Chertsey Abbey, where he was abbot, and Barking Abbey for his sister, Ethelberger. Uh, his fame as a healer and a saint endured and even survived the Norman conquest. St. Paul's, of course, uh, much changed by this time, was devastated by a great fire in 1087. The Saxon cathedral was destroyed, but the relics of Erkenwald were miraculously preserved. And Bishop Morris, one of the huge Norman personalities of the Middle Ages, set about building the great medieval St. Paul's, which was larger than the present one. It became the largest cathedral north of the Alps. And Erkenwald's relics were placed behind the high altar because the veneration of Anglo-Saxon saints by that time was part of an effort to bind the population of the kingdom together. Churches multiplied in London between this date and 1200, beginning either as private chapels or neighborhood, community, or guild places of worship and assembly. And the crucial importance of this network uh, can be readily understood. Life for most people was precarious. It wasn't until the 19th century that the population of London increased by its own generative capacities. The population previous to the 19th century uh, always increased by migration in from the countryside and from other countries. Disease, fire, sudden fluctuations in trading conditions exposed Londoners to frequent and devastating changes in fortune. Continental visitors noted with horror the alarming violence of the capital. We were known as a particularly violent place. The population grew as young people were drawn in from all over the country to serve their apprenticeships or to study at the inns of court. It made for a very volatile mix, 
exacerbated by social divisions between rich and poor and divisions between the various guilds, who quite often fought it out on the streets where riots were not unusual. And in this context, the existence in these centuries of a single united church uh, with various, uh, various centers observing the same rites and festivals was a powerful contribution to social peace and reconciliation between quarreling neighbors. The mass, ceaselessly repeated in a myriad of gloriously decorated churches and chantry chapels where you prayed for the souls of uh, the departed, they, that constituted a great uniting energy. So at a time when there were so many forces uh, making for an uncertain and ficiparous social life, this was the glue. The medieval city had over a hundred churches, countless other ecclesiastical institutions, monasteries, hospitals, but in the very brief reign of Edward VI, in the middle of the 16th century, there was a virtual cultural revolution, and much of the treasury of medieval English art was destroyed in a campaign of iconoclasm while the unity of the old Western church disintegrated. Um, when I was Bishop of London, I remember uh, receiving a letter from a church in Galicia where one of the statues from St. Paul's, um, condemned by Bishop Ridley, had been smuggled out, taken down to the docks, sold to some Spanish merchants who'd taken it off to Galicia. Different Christian confessions in a city grown obstinately metaphysical became a source of division rather than reconciliation. So religion becomes uh, one of the fragmenting forces. Despite efforts to prevent the accession of the devoutly Catholic Mary, daughter of Henry's discarded Queen Catherine, the princess came to the throne amid general rejoicing and set about reversing the legislation of her brother's reign and reconciling England to the Roman obedience. But her reign was not sufficiently long to embed this counter-reformation. Her successor, Elizabeth, presided over a cautious and defensive conformism which disappointed a growing Puritan party which agitated for a more thoroughgoing reformation. In the words of the great Tudor historian Patrick Collinson, the reformation that the Puritans wanted was an extensive program of national renewal which aspired to reform popular culture Everything from maypoles, football, plays and pubs, to speech and dress codes, and above all, the use of Sunday, now called the Sabbath, a set of values which applied the Old Testament to life as much as some Muslim regimes apply Sharia law. And yes, says Collinson, it included the death penalty for adultery, although Puritan ministers lacked the power of imams and ayatollahs to activate it. So this was um, an enormously powerful spiritual earthquake. There was continuing discontent that the Church of England was lagging behind the best reformed churches of the continent. Active criticism of aspects of the church's polity continued to grow as Elizabeth's reign came to an end. The reign of her successor, James I, was overshadowed by the Christian Civil War, which was already devastating Europe. James tried to play the Rex Pacificus, to identify common ground, to make peace even with Spain, and even to contemplate a Spanish match for his son Charles. And all this enraged the hotter English Puritans who pressed for intervention in the European war on the Protestant side. The liturgy and the polity of the Elizabethan church remained virtually intact, but the critics were not silenced, and with the attempts of Archbishop Lord abetted by the king to enforce a ceremonious uniformity, the Puritan onslaught became even more intense. And in 1641, as the royal government and the apparatus of censorship broke down, John Milton, educated at St. Paul's School, 
published his blistering of reformation in England and the causes that hitherto have hindered it. And Milton identifies two main obstacles, which, as he says, have still hindered our uniform consent to the rest of the churches abroad. These were the retention of vestiges of the old world in symbols and ceremonies, which uh, Milton, in a glorious piece of 17th century polemic, describes as gewgaws fetched from Aaron's old wardrobe and the Flamin's vestry. So it was old symbols and ceremonies that were still hanging around, and above all, it was bishops. By 1645, the archbishop had been beheaded. Bishops were abolished. The Book of Common Prayer was banned. The passions of the Civil War, in which a greater proportion of the male population of England perished than was killed in World War I, created martyrs, and most significantly a royal martyr for the Church of England, which could no longer be dismissed as a church of the lukewarm and the time-serving. We have a precious London eyewitness of the aftermath of these events in the person of the great Samuel Pepys. After a period in Huntingdon, where the roots of the Pepys family were, the young Samuel became a London schoolboy at St Paul's from the age of 13 for the next four years. St Paul's was the most strongly Calvinist of London schools in his day. The high master had campaigned for the abolition of bishops, which, as I say, came to pass in 1645, the year before Pepys' arrival at the school. St Paul's Cathedral, next door at this time, was used as a shopping mall and for stabling. The school was intimately connected with the cathedral, not least by its sanitary arrangements. The boy's urinal was the space between two buttresses on the north side, for which the school paid one red rose per annum. Hardly sufficient, one might think, to disguise the stink. Later, by the beginning of his diary period, Pepys had turned against enthusiasm and was a supporter of the Restoration. But the schoolboy Samuel was a Puritan and a Republican. And just before his 16th birthday, he was an eyewitness to the martyrdom of Charles I and remembers telling his friends at St. Paul's that if he had to preach a sermon on the king's execution, his text would be, the memory of the wicked shall rot. A period study in Cambridge led to a softening of his youthful Puritanism and uh, the uh, young peeps although not a member of any particular congregation as far as we know, certainly annoyed his more puritanical mother by attending a number of illegal Anglican services. The diary records frequent comments on sermons, but principally as rhetorical exercises. Pepys marks them in a manner of a severe housemaster. He doesn't record ever being touched by preaching, a good service for Pepys was like the one he attended at St. Alphege, Greenwich, on the 13th of January, 1660, where he noted, and I quote, a good sermon, a fine church, and a great company of handsome women. By this stage, in common with so many others who had lived, lived through the Civil War and the ensuing reign of the godly, Pepys was privately a skeptic, and he confides to his diary that Montague, his patron, had told him that in matters of religion he was wholly sceptical, and Pepys comments as well as I. He nevertheless continued the habit of reading the Bible to his household every week, as we learn from the entry for one Sunday in September 1661, which was the first time he had not held the family reading because he was drunk and durst not read prayers for fear of being perceived by my servants in what case I was. But he'd learnt to be very suspicious of enthusiasm, uh, a horror of corribantic ecstasy, and he uh, did exemplify a new spirit in Restoration London. But 
the old forces were still menacing and still present. In January 1661, Pepys writes this, This morning, news was brought to me at my bedside that there hath been a great stir in the city this night by the fanatics who have been up and killed six or seven men but are all fled. My Lord Mayor and the whole city have been in arms. And that night on his way home, Pepys and his party were in many places strictly examined more than in the worst of times, there being great fear of these fanatics rising again. Now, this was the rising of the Fifth Monarchy men, led by Thomas Venner, who'd come out of a service at their chapel in Coleman Street to conquer the world for Christ the King. They were to terrify the city for three days, taking refuge by night in the woods at Kenwood, near Highgate. On the 9th, Pepys found many fellow citizens in arms, so he returned home. <laughs> this is what's so marvellous about Pepys, of course. He, he's very unsparing as he looks at his own motivation. He says, I returned home, though with no good courage at all, but that I might not seem to be afeard, and got my sword and pistol, which, however, I have no powder to charge. After some years of slaughter on principle and homicidal religious zeal, it's not surprising that a period of cynicism followed. Our civil war was just part of a terrible sequence of destructive wars in the 17th century, to which religious divisions made a major contribution. They devastated the continent of Europe. And this is a very important point. The West European Enlightenment emerged out of horror and disgust with what religious fanaticism had done to the continent. And it's not just a coincidence that it was during the last decade from 1638 to 48 of the horrifying Thirty Years' War that Galileo published his dialogue concerning two new sciences and Descartes his principles of philosophy while Newton was born. As Richard Tarnas writes in his very fine book, the passion of the Western mind, the fragmentation brought about by warring Christian absolutisms argued the need for another type of belief system more rationally persuasive and less controversially subjected. Of course, this position was not incompatible with being a Christian believer of various kinds. Newton certainly was, as you can see from his voluminous writings on the book of Daniel, and there's another example, St. Paul's Cathedral itself. Its architect, Christopher Wren, his father was ejected from his home by enthusiastic Protestants during the Civil War. His uncle, Matthew, spent 15 years in the tower for the same reason. And as we've seen, the early years of the Restoration were haunted by the fear that fanatics of various kinds could make a comeback. And Wren's answer is in St. Paul's and in the city churches. God is a God of beauty and order, quite like an architect, in fact, and not a God of volcanic and irrational enthusiasm. A bishop was among the prominent founders of the Royal Society, and in England the divorce between a scientific approach and faith was never so pronounced and absolute as it often was on the continent. Now, one of the reasons why the political culture of this country continues to be different from that of our continental neighbours is that religion in the past two or three centuries has never been the defining issue in the battles between left and right. And this arises from one of the consequences of the religious settlement in Pepys's time. Despite their best efforts, the three strands of Christian tradition in England all failed to achieve what they all desired, which was to create a religious monopoly. Puritans, prelatists, papists all attempted to establish a monopoly. They fought one another to a standstill and without intending it, opened the door to pluralism. And when it became necessary to confront the injustices of the established political and economic status quo in the 19th century, 
The, earlier, the early trade unionists, the Tollpuddle Martyrs, were led not by Marxist agitators, but by Methodist lay preachers. And in England, however much you might dislike the Church of England, it was never necessary to oppose Jesus Christ to agitate for change. In countries which combined an authoritarian tradition with a religious monopoly, however, where Christ seemed bizarrely to be an ally of the status quo, then in those countries, Russia, Prussia, France, Spain, Italy, religious monopoly spawned large left-wing atheist parties. By contrast, in England, the membership of the British Communist Party has at no point ever equaled the membership of the Lord's Day Observance Society. In much of the rest of Europe, especially in France, the Enlightenment tradition was more closely identified with anti-clericalism, and laicite is still a force in French politics. It led President Chirac and Premier Jospin to intervene famously to expunge positive references to the Christian contribution to the history of Europe from a significant EU text in support of the French view that nothing valuable happened in European culture between the death of Marcus Aurelius and the birth of Voltaire. In Pepys's day, there were strenuous efforts to build an Anglican confessional state, but he's a guide to the ebbing of obstinate metaphysical zeal and its replacement by a sane conformism and a lively curiosity about the wonders of the natural world revealed by the microscope and the telescope. And the early 19th century saw the definitive end of the project to create a confessional state in England with the repeal of the Test Act in 1828, which allowed um, uh, people who were not members of the Church of England to participate in various aspects of uh, government, Catholic emancipation in the following year, government assistance, was withdrawn, it was no longer forthcoming for church building to accommodate the rapidly expanding population. Instead, there was an assault on the remaining endowments of the church in Ireland. During this period also, the cities of London and Westminster were centers of the agitation which eventually succeeded in opening membership of parliament to practicing Jews. And this is something which uh, in the city we ought to be very proud of Bevis Marx uh, in our city is the oldest synagogue in the UK and after the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands and the closure of the great synagogue of Amsterdam during World War II, Bevis Marx can claim the longest history of uninterrupted Jewish worship in Europe. The beginnings of greater religious diversity in the 19th century were greatly augmented, of course, by the demographic transformation of the capital after the Second World War, reflected in the statistics that I quoted from the census. Some saw this as a problem and feared that rival faith groups might fight like ferrets in a sack. And this was the context for the foundation and development of the Centre of Reconciliation and Peace at St. Ethelberger's Church Bishopsgate, a church named after the sister of the great bishop, Erkenwald. Exactly 25 years ago, in 1993, the church was uh, collateral damage in the bomb that uh, went off in Bishopsgate. A photojournalist, Edward Henty, was killed, sheltering in the doorstep, uh, and more than 50 people were injured. At the time I was Bishop of London, it seemed obvious to me that we couldn't allow the IRA to succeed where Hitler had failed, but my colleagues, who perhaps knew more of the details than I did, who'd lived with the Ethelberger problem for years, uh, life had been at a quite low ebb there, they disagreed, and I was outvoted 12 to 1, and it was decided to hold an architectural competition to construct a suite of offices whilst preserving the one arcade which had survived the blast. The resulting design was turned down by the city planners 18 to 1. And by this time, I'd become the Bishop of London and was able to change the arithmetic in the diocesan team. 
And with the ready assistance of Cardinal Hume and Janet Sarbats, moderator of the Thames North province of the United Reformed Church, we set about raising the funds to build a centre for reconciliation and peace to prevent and transform those many conflicts in the modern world which have a religious dimension. And the idea from the beginning was to offer the centre as a gift to all the faith communities, especially in London. But since the quarrel which had ignited the bomb derived some of its energy from an intra-Christian dispute, those originally involved in rebuilding the centre came from every part of the Christian community, although we were soon joined by friends from the other Abrahamic traditions. Even in 1996, I saw that we were not going to be allowed to take a holiday from history and that the orthodoxy in Northwestern Europe, that religion would be steadily marginalized as the process of modernization unfolded, it was being challenged, and not least, in the Islamic Revolution in Iran. I had the privilege of giving a lecture as the century was ending in 1999 at the Humboldt University in Berlin, arguing for the need for some faith-based response to the likelihood of conflict in which religious beliefs had been weaponized. The arguments advanced then in 1999 seem very obvious now, once the dreadful events of 9-11 in New York had changed the way in which we now regard the very different landscape of the 21st century. I said in Berlin, religion in many parts of the world is crucial to social cohesion it's therefore likely to be co-opted in any struggle which centers on the identity of any particular group or people. As a believer, I can very easily see the perils of religion. I can sympathize with the position adopted by a great 18th century clergyman of the Church of England, Bishop Warburton. The bishop was said to occupy a small corner of reasonableness within the ark, as much disgusted by the stink within as by the tempest without. The trouble seems to be that if we don't exercise our faculty for worship in some worthy tradition, then the vacuum is filled by something diabolical. And it is not possible to exercise, exorcise the diabolical by creating a spiritual vacuum. In 1999, this was still a thesis which didn't convince many of those who developed a view of religion as a more or less harmless lifestyle choice, like vegetarianism, with very little significance in the daylight world. But over the past 25 years, without grandstanding, the Ethelberger Center has played host to every conceivable kind of faith community. A number of toolkits have been developed which have proved themselves in actual conflict situations. The facilities have been enhanced as a result of the generosity of a Muslim friend who presented the center with a Gore-Tex and goat's hair tent of assembly stitched in Saudi, which emits a wonderful fragrance in Bishopsgate when it rains. Interfaith relations have been deepened with the practice of scriptural reasoning, originally developed from a Jewish initiative in the US. Believers from different traditions confront contemporary questions drawing on their respective scriptures. There are no polemics, but each participant has to speak accountably in the hearing of all the others. And most often the result is a deeper conviction about one's own tradition together with a greater respect for the others. And at the same time, the center has welcomed musicians and artists to celebrate the many facets of spirituality. All this emerged from a 20th century anticipation of the renewed salience of religious faith and institutions in the 21st century and their capacity to be complicit in conflict or a possible resource for peace building. The anxiety about extremism and radicalization reflected in recent government and police policy announcements demonstrates the continuing relevance of the work of the center, but the wider landscape has changed. 
and we are having to confront new threats and devise a fresh response. As recently as 1992, Francis Fukuyama, in his book, The End of History, thought that he had identified the end point, as he says, of mankind's ideological evolution, the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. In alliance with market economics, enlightenment was reshaping the world. In consequence, God had been banished to the leisure sector as a harmless lifestyle choice. Now, there are still people who believe that this is the long-term trend, whatever the blips along the way may be. But John Gray dissents, and in a very important essay in a recent edition of the New Statesman, he thinks there has been a radical liberal misreading of history, a misreading of history. He argues that the liberal democratic vision is of a world without precedent in which nationalism and religion will no longer be deciding forces in politics and rivalry for territory and resources will have been left behind, while basic freedoms will be protected in a universal framework of human rights. In dissenting from this vision, he goes on to say that liberal regimes are not freestanding structures of law and rights, but political constructions that depend for their survival on hard power and popular acceptance. And both these foundations are eroding. The hard power since World War II was supplied by unchallengeable American hegemony. America is now chastened by the chaos following the attempts to impose liberal order on Iraq, Libya, Syria, and by the unending war in Afghanistan. The US is also challenged by alternative models of government and economic development, notably China. What about popular acceptance? Polls reveal a considerable pessimism about the prospects for social mobility and rising living standards in the most developed liberal countries. And revolutions are made not by the poor. This is one of the most obvious lessons of history. Revolutions are made by the disappointed. And there are many people, not least in the UK, who believe that they will not enjoy the opportunities that their parents had. Post-war social mobility was fueled by the creation of a large number of white-collar jobs of just the kind that are now under threat from globalization and AI. And it is perfectly rational to anticipate the contraction of the market for the labor, especially of modestly skilled men, and a consequent loss among this vulnerable group of dignity and self-respect. There have been attempts to bolster popular acceptance by inserting an emphasis on so-called British values in the education curriculum. Ofsted has defined British values as democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty and mutual respect, and probably none of us would wish to dissent from any of those. The problem is that it is very difficult to translate these worthy abstractions, these generalizations, into transformative energy with a real impact on our lives. The universals have to be embedded in a particular community and its institutions in which we can feel at home and feel valued. And in addition, such generalizations have to be carried by particular stories with iconic figures capable of generating proper pride if they are to have a deep impact. A snatch of conversation from many years ago haunts me. After some communal rioting in the East End, I visited a number of schools with the message that we ought to respect one another's cultures, social and religious. And I was confronted by a furious white teenager on the Isle of Dogs who said, well, what's my effing culture then, Bish? He spoke from a sense of poverty. He spoke from a sense that he'd lost his self-respect. 
which all too easily translates into hostility and even violence towards outsiders. In his discussion of democracy, Aristotle notes the tendency of democracies to deteriorate into oclocracies. Oclos means a crowd, and oclocracy is the rule by a crowd of atomized individuals swept and tossed around by gusts of anger stimulated by sophists, and we would substitute the social media. This creates an unstable situation, and the next step is some kind of tyranny. In our case, it will probably be of the administrative kind, equipped with a vastly increased capacity for surveillance and social control. In some of the states seeking to challenge the present unstable status quo, religion has been co-opted. Governments in Russia, Hungary, and Poland have appealed to Christian values, while political Islam of various kinds continues to shape the Middle East. It is noteworthy that attempts to counter the appeal of alternative for Germany in the federal state of Bavaria by directing that crosses should be installed in public buildings have elicited most heavyweight opposition from the churches themselves. And this is a non-trivial fact. Recent surveys reported by Tobias Kramer in his recent important New Statesman article, Defenders of the Faith, have demonstrated that such strategies co-opting Christian symbolism are in, in, uh, in the service of right-wing populist movements are least effective in persuading practicing as against merely cultural Christians. Regular churchgoers are least likely to support AFD in Germany. And at the same time, however, in a generally negative report in the Times on the effectiveness of anti-extremism strategies, there is a recognition of the impact which courses which draw on the resources of religious texts, Torah, Bible, Quran, have on changing attitudes. Is it possible that we who still cherish the ideals of personal freedom and tolerance could find resources for hope in the Judeo-Christian culture which created the soil in which liberal democracy grew in the first place? Is it possible that we could build new alliances with other world faiths on the near universal agreement among the world's great wisdom traditions that we should strive to do as we would wish to be done by. Our country is becoming one of unparalleled diversity. London in particular, as I've said, is a laboratory where the future of the human project on this planet is being explored. Without denying the spiritual contribution of other religious traditions to social well-being, churches in the past have been places where it has been possible for people to encounter others with radically different life histories in an environment formed by worship of the one God beyond them all. The experience of belonging to a community of this kind, exemplified by early Methodism, engenders self-respect. It provides training in the give and take, the deep listening, which is a condition for genuinely democratic life. Worship and participation in a community of faith rehearses a narrative, directs attention beyond the individual self in a way which makes individual persons members one of another. For Christians, every individual person is unique and unrepeatable, not to be confused or homogenized, but we find our meaning and our joy in life and an intimation of eternal life as we keep the commandment to love and relate together in God. And God enables us to live in this way because this is the nature of God's own being. The 20th century was marked by a great political contest between ideologies which oppose the individual and the collective. And as we search at a time of promise and peril for a new synthesis, it could be that the historic role of the faith communities, 
recognized in Alexis de Tocqueville's great work on American democracy as places where democratic manners are cultivated and individualism is tempered by devotion to a common cause will be pivotal in preserving the best of the liberal democratic tradition in the challenging circumstances of 21st century London. Religion and nationalism have been seen as subversive of the liberal project. But if they are banished to the shadowy, shadowy margins, away from the challenge, to provide a reasonable account of themselves in the public square, they can easily become toxic as believers speak words of fire to one another in companies of the converted. It is, I believe, time to reassess radically our engagement with both religion and a sane patriotism and to balance our understandable concern about extremism with a clearer recognition of the resources that both religion and love of one's country can provide in the restoration of hope which is so urgently required. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>